As we mentioned earlier, today is the second Sunday in Advent. And if you remember from, from last Sunday's message, we talked about Advent coming from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming. And this is a time of the year when we pause to reflect upon the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as that small baby in a manger, but it's also the time when we anticipate the fact that Jesus said that he is coming again, the second coming of Christ. But let me ask you this question. When you hear these words, three more weeks until Christmas, how does that make you feel? Does it make you feel joyful that in just a, a few weeks we could unite our hearts together as a church family to sing uh, such wonderful uh, Christmas hymns like Joy to the World, the Lord has Come? Or do those words make you feel a little bit anxious and uneasy and stressed? The other day I was talking with someone who was telling me that they have so much to do yet in this month of December. And she was saying, why can't Christmas just be Christmas, the celebration of our Lord's birth? But she was saying that she has so much to do. She says that there's so much shopping to do, Christmas cards to get out, too many people to buy gifts for, uh, too many uh, groups of people to spend the, the holidays with. And she was saying that she's just getting a little bit stressed out over this holiday season, recognizing that she has so much to do and so little time to do it in. So let me ask this question. Does anybody feel that way? In your sermon outline, you would see uh, just a, a little test. And uh, on one side, it says, you know, as you look at the upcoming uh, Christmas season, do you feel joyful or stressed? So on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, where do you see yourself right now at this moment? For me, I have to say that, you know, living in Monterey is, is, is less stressful than it was when I was living down in, in Southern California. Uh, the church I pastored down there was, uh, was a church of over 500 people. It was busy. There were always things to do, people to see. And so uh, pastoring uh, is a little bit less stressful. But nevertheless, for many of you, uh, this might be a time when your lives are, are speeding up. And... Part of it is trying to slow down amidst the busyness. Henry Nowen, who is one of my favorite authors, I think he was one of Reverend Hay's favorite authors as well, in his book, Making All Things New, he wrote these words. One characteristic of our lives today is that we are busy. We experience our days filled with things to do, people to meet, projects to finish, letters to write, calls to make, appointments to keep. Our lives often seem like packed, overpacked suitcases bursting at the seams. It seems as though we feel we are almost always behind schedule. There is this nagging sense that there are unfinished tasks, unfulfilled promises, unrealized proposals. There is always something else that we have uh, that we should have remembered uh, to get done or said. There are always people we did not speak to, write to, or visit. It seems as though we have this lingering feeling of never really fulfilling our obligations. And it seems like all of these things are magnified as we enter into the Christmas season. And because of these things, it's no wonder that many people at this time of the year are feeling overwhelmed and stressed. And you know, they say that the time between Thanksgiving and New Year's are the most stressful time of the year. But you know, despite all the business that you may have, especially at this time of the year, it's an even greater challenge to give our Lord our undivided attention. One of the passages of scriptures that's been speaking to me a lot lately is a passage of scripture from the Apostle Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35, where he writes, I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Undivided devotion to the Lord. And in the midst of this Advent and Christmas season, we need to be careful that we don't get so busy that we leave Christ out of Christmas. Because after all, this is the reason why we celebrate Christmas. Jesus is the reason for this season. 
from duties to deadlines, from desserts to make and dishes to clean, all of these things can easily eclipse the time that we need to set aside to worship God and to give thanks for his wondrous gift in Jesus Christ. This morning I want to look at a, a pattern of life that I believe is important for all of us to think about and ponder and to reflect upon as we enter into this Advent season. And I want us to look this morning at a woman by the name of Mary. And first of all, I want to say that this Mary is not Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus, but another Mary. This morning I want to talk about Mary, who was the sister of Lazarus and Martha. And I believe that this is a Mary that we are also familiar with. And this story of Mary comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. So if you have your Bibles and you want to join with me this morning, uh, please turn to Luke 10, 38 to 42. Now the story that we're going to read about today takes place in the village of Bethany, which is located just outside of Jerusalem. And from what we can glean from this passage and in John chapters 11 and 12, Martha lived with her sister Mary and her brother Lazarus, whom Jesus would later raise from the dead. And it appears that Martha is a widow because it mentions that she is the head of the household in this uh, morning's scripture passage. And here in the home of Martha, Mary and Lazarus, and Jesus and his disciples, they sit down for some relaxation away from the press of the crowds. Here is a home that Jesus had been to many times before. It was a place that he knew well. It was a place where he knew that he was loved and accepted. And both sisters are delighted to see Jesus, as we'll see. But they express their love and devotion to Jesus in very different ways. So let me read from Luke 10, 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Well, I want us to notice several things as we turn to this morning's passage of Scripture. And the first thing that I want us to see is Mary's approach to Jesus. You know, um, as you study the Bible, every time that you read about this Mary, we see Mary at the feet of Jesus. And there are several things that I think we can learn from Mary. First of all, from Mary, we learn that she shares her woes. She shares her woes. And we see this from John chapter 11, verse 32, where it says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you remember from this passage of scripture, uh, Mary's brother Lazarus had taken ill. And they had sent word to Jesus to come and to heal him. But scripture says that when Jesus heard that Lazarus, this one that he had loved, was ill, he stayed where he was for two more days. And so at this time, Mary was filled with, with great grief at the passing of her brother Lazarus. And you know, as I, I think about our own church family here, there have been many people who have lost loved ones over the past year and nine, ten months that I've been here at Alistero. I counted something like 20 of our loved ones have passed away. And you think about our, our brother uh, uh, Lyle this morning going through a time of sorrow and grief at the passing of his brother Jack this past week. And you know, for, for some in our congregation, this will be the first Christmas without their, their loved ones. And so not only do people suffer the stress and grief of the loss of loved ones, but this is a time of the year when we see uh, a rise in suicides, we see a rise in, in DUIs, we see a rise in spousal abuse. And some of these things can happen because we don't take our cares and our burdens and cast them upon the Lord. 
And so for many people, the holidays have become their holidays. Now, what did Mary do as she went through this time of sorrow and grief? We see that she comes to the feet of Jesus and she casts her cares upon him. Mary turned to cast her cares upon the Lord. Just like 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So Mary was very open. She cast her woes upon Jesus. But secondly, we see that she spends time in worship. In John 12, 3, we see another example of Mary's lifestyle. And again, she's at the feet of Jesus. It says, then Mary took a... a about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with this fragrance of the perfume. A pint of nard in the time that Jesus lived was probably equivalent to one year's wages. So it was very, very costly for Mary to pour this perfume on the feet of Jesus. So let me ask you this question. When was the last time that worship was costly for you? King David put it this way in 2 Samuel 24, 24. But the king replied to Eriuna, No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. You see, as David, King David, went into the presence of the Lord, he knew that the Lord wasn't so much interested in sacrifices, but he was interested in the heart's desire to give him everything um, that he could. For King David, worship cost something. And you know, for, for many of us, I, I think that church can become habitual and not really costly to us. It's something that we go through the motions with each and every Sunday. We come to a service of worship, but what does it cost us? And we adopt a routine for our worship that's oftentimes resting in our, in our comfort zones. Well, maybe one of the things that you might consider doing during this Advent and Christmas season is giving a Christmas gift to Jesus. How many of you ever given a, a Christmas gift to Jesus? And what does that mean? Well, maybe you can do something for Jesus that, that's costly. Maybe it's, it's going beyond your regular tithes and offerings. But maybe it's giving something to, to someone in the church who has a need. Maybe it's meeting a need in the church. Maybe you know missionaries who are out serving the Lord in distant places. And maybe giving a gift to them in the name of Jesus would be something uh, that would truly be honored by the Lord. When you think about the words of the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, he says this, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and then he adds, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. In other words, let us do good to everyone, but especially to, the, to those who belong to the household of faith, fellow believers, Christians in Jesus Christ. And then maybe you could also give to those who are also outside of the house of faith. The Bible says in Matthew 25, 40, truly I tell you, whatever you do for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. And that would be a gift to Jesus. Maybe something beyond uh, what you would normally be giving. And so we see Martha here, or Mary here, giving worship to God by something that was costly to her. And then another thing we see about Mary, she soaks in Jesus' words. Luke 10.39 says, She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. And here we see Mary just listening. And how important it is for just to listen, to listen to the words of the Lord. 1 Kings 19.12 tells us that the voice of the Lord is oftentimes a still, quiet, silent voice. In this holiday season, everything gets so loud, it gets so busy, it gets so commercialized that sometimes Christmas can be deafening. And it takes an effort to try to turn out all of the distractions that we see around us and truly try to listen to the voice of the Lord. How many of you have ever had a hard time listening to someone? 
And what do you do if you have a hard time listening to someone? You try to get a little bit closer to hear, right? And that's maybe something that we can visualize as we enter into this time of, of Advent and Christmas. We might have a harder time listening to Jesus, but to lean in, get closer to Jesus. The Bible says in James 4, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So we need to take, uh, maybe make a, a conscious effort to lean in, to listen a little bit more closely to the word of God because of all the distractions that, that we have around us. And then next we see Martha's approach to Jesus. And you know, when we look at the life of Mary, we see that she's always at the feet of Jesus. But then when we look at the life of Martha, one of the things that we see about Martha is that she's always working. If you wanted something done, you went to Martha. And even at the death of her brother Lazarus, while Mary was paralyzed at grief at the passing of her brother, Martha went out and she sought Jesus. She went to, to meet Jesus. And Martha was a great worker. And workers for the Lord are vitally important uh, in our day and age. But work for the Lord needs to be balanced with worshiping the Lord. And so one of the things that, that we see here in the life of Martha, she sends out a welcome. Verse 38 says, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. The intention of Martha started out very honorably. She had all the intention to, to honor Jesus and to welcome Jesus into her home. And Martha was probably one like her sister who previously had spent times at the feet of Jesus listening and soaking up her words. And like many of you, this Christmas will be a, a time when you're going to be welcoming people into your homes. Maybe it's family members, maybe it's friends. And, and that's an honorable uh, uh, time of the, this is an honorable time of the year to do that. But what happened to Martha as she opened up her home to serve? The first thing that we see is that she got stressed out about her work. Verse 40 says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Can't you see Martha stomping around her house? She's banging the dishes. She's pounding her fist through the dough, the, the dough every time she walked past Mary, who was sitting at the feet of Jesus. The service trap can happen to all of us. You ask a person about themselves, and, and immediately they may tell you about what they do. And why do they do that? And I think it's because oftentimes we attach our worth to our work. And oftentimes we attach our, our worth to our work, and we, we see that in the life of Martha. Mar Martha started out working as a way to show Jesus that she was sincere about her faith and her love for him. But that's not how it ended up. You may have started out, or you may start out this Christmas season with great intentions, but we may fall into that service trap. But the good news is there's a way out. And we see that again in the life of Martha. One of the things we see, she, she scolds uh, them with her wrath. In verse 40, again, she says, she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. You see, being too busy can lead to being too bossy. And that was one of the things that Mary didn't want to do, but it was one of the things that she ended up doing. The one thing she wanted to do was to bring her ad adoration to Jesus, but in the end, she ended up getting angry at him. And it was sort of like a, a double-edged sword that was wheeled out of her anger. One side accuses Jesus for his lack of concern, and the other cuts Mary, accusing her for being lazy. She was so angry that she doesn't even call her sister Mary by name. She was really ticked off. Well, in the next few verses, we see the master's approach to Martha. How did Jesus approach both Mary and Martha? First of all, he speaks to Martha in warmth. Verse 41, Martha, Martha. The Lord had every right to get upset with Martha for lashing out at him. And yet we see the nature of Jesus. 
that he was filled with compassion. He knew he understood everything that Martha was going through. And we see this quality that endears our heart to Jesus. Every time you see the Lord mentioning someone's name twice, it's an act of endearment. He did this in Luke 13, 34, when he talks about Jerusalem. He did the same thing with Simon Peter in Luke 22, 31, where he says, Simon, Simon. We even see this on the road to Damascus when the apostle Paul was hit by the blinding light and where the apostle Paul in Acts 9, 4 says, Saul, Saul. So for Jesus to mention a person's name twice was really a sign of worth, warmth and compassion. It was an endearing tone in which Jesus approached Martha. And then Jesus shares how Martha is wrong in verse 41. He says, you're worried and upset about many things. And this word worried in the Greek language is meri minao, meri minao. And meri minao is the word that we get our English word marionette from. How many of you have ever seen a a marionette puppet, strings attached, and a lot of times were pulled in a lot of different directions by, by these strings. And so oftentimes during this time, we begin to spread ourselves out too thinly. So our priorities need to be re-examined, especially at this time of the year when there are so many things that are, are trying to crowd out our hearts and minds. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Scripture says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so in easily entangled us. And so when you look at your life during this holiday season, you see the busyness and the things that are seeking to crowd out, spending that undivided time, that devotion to the Lord. And oftentimes we need to examine or re-examine our priorities at Christmas time. And if something tends to get out of the way, out of alignment, then we need to bring that back. Oftentimes, when you, you look at our, our schedules, we, we are, are more focused on the, imp the urgent things rather than the important things. There was a, a, a book that was written once by a man by the name of Charles Hummel called The Tyranny of the Urgent. And in that book, Tyranny of the Urgent, he talks about we're always going to have urgent things. There's always going to be people to meet, always going to be uh, letters to write, so many urgent things. And oftentimes the urgent things eclipse those things that are really important. So the Advent season is a time of the year when we could really focus in once again on what is truly important. And what is important? Our relationship with the Lord, our relationship with, with family, our relationship with, with other believers, the church. Remember to refocus your priorities at this time of the year. And then we see that Jesus states uh, to Martha true wisdom. Closes in verse 42. He says, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And do you notice how Jesus responds with great tenderness and wisdom to Martha? Jesus didn't rebuke Martha for making preparations for him and the other guests. He's not rejecting Martha's attempt to serve him. Martha's problem was not that she was preparing to, uh, food for her guests. Rather, it was that she was paying too much attention to it. She gave too much importance to it. And Jesus said that what Mary had done was that she had chosen the better. The time of sitting at the feet of Jesus would not be taken away from her because Jesus was only going to be around just a little while longer. And so as we prepare to celebrate Christmas, the important thing is that we don't let the necessary things that we must get done get out of balance and distortion in our lives, that the urgent things don't take place over that which is truly important. Because again, we will always have the urgent things to do, but our eyes need to be focused on what is truly important. And so the point of this story with Mary and Martha is not that Mary is right and Martha is wrong. In fact, Mary would be wrong if she didn't get up and start to work 
and to help out in serving Jesus. But I believe many times we have wrongly contrasted Mary and Martha, as though each Christian should make a choice between being a worker or a worshiper. But in doing so, I think we miss the point that the Lord wants us to imitate Mary in our worship and also to imitate Martha in our work and that we need to find and achieve the balance in doing both. And so this Christmas, may we not become so entrapped with all the lights and the tinsel of Christmas and all the busyness that this season brings, but may we find the time to be like Martha in our service of the Lord, and may we find time to be like Martha, our Mary, to sit at the feet of Jesus. And in spending time in worship, in spending time soaking up the word of the Lord, this is how we can have a Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this well-known story of Mary and Martha. Father, so often it is confusing that we think that the important thing for us is just to sit at the feet of Jesus and, and to not serve. And Father, I pray that through this message, Lord, that we would be reminded that both are important, but that in the busyness of our schedules, especially, Lord, at this time of the year, that we would find that balance that would truly be pleasing and acceptable to you. Minister these words to our heart this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.